Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to King of Kings on the second Sunday of Advent. Today we're confronted with the truth that on the last day, on Judgment Day, all people will see God's salvation. The only question is whether or not we meet the coming of Jesus with joy or dread in our hearts. And those who have rejected God and his salvation, those who have refused to repent, Jesus is coming to bring destruction and judgment. But for those in whose hearts the Holy Spirit has worked faith and repentance, Jesus is coming to bring deliverance, and he will appear like a banner on a hillside calling us to his glorious side. That's the focus of our worship today. We light two Advent candles this morning remembering Jesus who came in history. He came into a world of sin and death. We hear his call to repent. We light two Advent candles as a sign of our repentance and desire for renewal. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. Amen. Join me in hymn number 318, Hark a Thrilling Voice of Sound. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, we have turned away from you and sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. We have done the things you forbid, and we have not done the things you command. We have loved and served ourselves rather than you, and have not loved our neighbors as you have loved us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we are bold to ask for forgiveness. Turn us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may love and serve you with our whole heart and soul. God has heard our plea for forgiveness, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, he answers our prayer. As a called servant of the word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson is recorded in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. The coming Lord will bring such peace that even natural enemies will no longer live in conflict with one another. His rule will be one of perfect righteousness, and the poor will find deliverance in him. A shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse, and the branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will be delighted with the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, nor will he render decisions based on what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and he will render fair decisions in favor of the oppressed on the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of, from his lips he will put the wicked to death. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his hips. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat the calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze together, and their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the cattle. The nursing child will play near a cobra's hole, and the weaned child will put his hand into a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. This is what will take place on that day. The peoples will seek the root of Jesse, who will be standing like a banner for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 130. It's on page four of your worship folder. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Lord, if you kept track of sins, O oh Lord, then who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. In order that you may be here. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word have my hope. More than watchers wait for the morning. My soul waits for the Lord. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. With him is complete redemption. You will redeem Israel from the guilt of all their sins. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The second lesson is recorded in Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. Paul encourages the believers in Rome, as well as us, to live in the kind of life that Isaiah described. Indeed, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that through patient endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we would have hope. And may God, the source of patient endurance and encouragement, grant that you agree with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that with one mind, in one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, accept one another as Christ also accepted you to the glory of God. For I am saying that Christ became a servant of those who are circumcised for the sake of God's truth, to conform the promises made to the patriarchs. He also did this so that the Gentiles would glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. For this reason, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. Again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples give him praise. And again, Isaiah says, there will be a root of Jesse, and he is the one who will rise up to rule the Gentiles. On him the Gentiles will place their hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe, so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. All mankind will see God's salvation. Hallelujah. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel and also our sermon text is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. John the Baptist proclaimed a message of repentance because the kingdom of God was near. In those days, John the Baptist appeared preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. Yes, this is he of whom it was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all of the region around the Jordan were going out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out for his baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think of saying to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Already the axe is ready to strike at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who comes after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated for the hymn of the day. Hymn number 316 on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Cry.
Grace and mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, a while back I was driving on the southern 202 loop on the east side, right where it turns north. That area where buildings seem to grow up out of the ground like Weeds pop out of the desert dust after an Arizona spring rain. And as I was driving along, I looked at one of the new buildings, and it appeared as though somebody had poured the cement panels, and they were out of plumb. And I looked at it closer, and I realized it was just the design that was tricking my eye into thinking that, but just looking at it, Initially, something appeared off. I had that same feeling when I read these words from Matthew's Gospel. You think about it. At a time when Caesar ruled the world, when Pontius Pilate was Rome's representative in Judea, when the high priests and Jewish officials did their thing in Jerusalem, Matthew chooses to highlight something that was going out on out in the middle of nowhere by a nobody. <coughs> in fact, it was even worse than a nobody. John appeared to be completely out of touch. His clothing was made of camel's hair, so thick and so coarse it would have made a better carpet than a coat. Uh, just last week on the news, I heard somebody, some official encouraging us to make locusts a regular part of our diet because it's a renewable source of protein. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just as out of place in their culture as it would be in ours today. And that was John's diet. And yet, this relatively nowhere place and this nobody, this guy that seemed like a coop, that was God's chosen servant to prepare God's people for the coming Messiah, to proclaim a message at a vital time. And even though he appeared like he was completely out of touch, a little bit of a kook, Jesus says of this man, he was the greatest man ever born of a woman. Great because he was the fulfillment of a prophecy made by Isaiah, the prophet, 700 years earlier. He was the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. You see, after 400 years without a prophet, after 400 years of silence, God was making good on his promise to send another prophet to prepare the hearts of God's people for the coming Messiah. And John was going to be pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But first, he was going to prepare their hearts with a simple and yet powerful message. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. Simple message, powerful message, and yet one that is tough to swallow. The idea that we're corrupt and ruined and condemned. Before we can even communicate one thought to our mother, this idea that little innocent babies that depend on someone else for their basic human needs can be born in sin, completely ruined. It's counterintuitive. But God himself is the one who says through his chosen mouthpiece, David, we're sinful from the point of birth. Sinful from the very moment the first signs of life appear in our mother's wombs. It's a simple yet powerful message and one that is difficult to swallow. You go to any other church, almost any other church in Apache Junction, and you're not going to hear about it. 
They'll point to Jesus, the Lamb of God, but they will completely ignore what made his coming into the world necessary. They'll talk about how Jesus is caring and loving and provides power for life and even provides heaven, but they will completely gloss over what made us in such desperate need of his care, his power, his help completely ignore, that we're absolutely dependent on someone else to bring us that gift of heaven. It's a simple, powerful message that's hard for people out there to swallow, but truth be told, it's hard for us to swallow too, maybe even more so. We acknowledge our sin. We confess our unworthiness. We confess that we are absolutely dependent on the Lamb of God to take away our sin. And I talk about this all the time in Bible class. I spend the majority of my time in the sermon trying to convince you of your desperate need for him because we want to move on to the good stuff. That idea of a sinful heart so riddled and diseased with sin, that's not something that we want laid out on an autopsy table. That is an image too ugly for us, and so we want to move on. We move on to actions. Because actions are easy to place on a scale. I can load up the other side of the scale with somebody else's wickedness and evil deeds and bad things that they do, and then I can put all my minor faults My insignificant errors on the other side, and as long as the scale is bottomed out on the other side, I figure I'm good. Actions are easy to sweep away. Actions are easy to justify by circumstance. Actions are easy to blame on someone else, pointing out their failures. And maybe even easier to ignore than our sinful actions is our failure to be what God wants us to be, to do what God wants us to do. Unfixable brokenness. Absolute devastation, thorough destruction, damnable evil. We don't want to see that image when we look in our hearts. And so we skip past that gruesome image, but I'm going to tell you today, don't do it. Resist that urge to look away, because it's only when we view that gruesome image that our hearts can truly be be prepared to receive Jesus at his coming. John's message was repent, literally Change your thinking. Change the way you think about sin. Change the way you think about your priorities, your desires, your motives, the way you live. Change it. The problem is, before we come to faith, we can't think, much less change our minds. By nature, even if our goals and our desires happen to match some of God's goals and desires, we wouldn't be able to see the life that God truly had in mind for us because we're blind. But the nail in the coffin, any hope of us changing our minds or turning ourselves around is Paul's descriptions of, description of our heart, which is dead. Dead. Dead people can't think. Dead people can't change their minds. They can't shift their focus. They can't change their priorities. And a dead soul can't change the way they live. Well, some of the walking dead came out to meet John, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they wanted to shut down John's operation. And John lets them have it. He blasts them with unvarnished truth. And we get a little glimpse as to why when he calls them a brood of vipers, offspring of vipers, little snakes of the big snake. He confronted them with the fact that God's anger was burning against them and his judgment was about to come down on them like an ax on a tree, and they didn't want to hear it. They instead wanted to tell themselves, we're descendants of Abraham. 
We have a connection to God's holy people. But John says, if God wanted to, he could raise up children from the rocks on the ground, calling on them to produce fruits of repentance was kind of like looking for oranges on the leafless, wilted, dead orange tree in the back of the administration building. The only thing left for God to do was to put his ax to the trunk, chop them down, and throw them into the fire. And when we blow past the wreckage of our sin, and we, when we don't embrace our deadness, it's very easy for us to fall into that very same trap. We, we're at church all the time. We've been here each and every Sunday since we grew up. If anyone is worthy of God's forgiveness and love, it is we who fill these pews every single Sunday. But it's when you recognize how dead you are. When you realize you're walking in a wilderness of sin without food and without water, you realize how much help you need. You might be able to fool yourself once in a while into thinking that you can possibly survive, but you are walking dead, and I am too, in desperate need of a Savior. Repentance can't come from a sincere desire. Repentance can come from a renewed effort to be different. Digging down deeper inside of yourself is only digging your own grave. What hope do we have of escaping God's wrath when Jesus returns on the last day? There must be hope. There must be help outside of us. John says it. I baptize you with water for repentance. To someone who doesn't understand what's going on at the baptismal font, that can seem like a wall that's out of plumb in Eastmark. It can seem like a kook out in the wilderness, splashing water around, spouting off in between meals of grasshoppers and wild honey. To someone who doesn't understand what's going on here, it may seem like a ritual and a rite the splashing of a few drops of water, the sign of a cross, but God tells us something amazing happens at the baptismal font. The water is simple water that comes out of the tap, and yet it's special water, not because of the water itself, but because of the promise of God attached to that water, that it strips from us, it cleanses us, it washes away all of our guilt and all of our sin and all of our rebellion and who we used to be goes into that baptismal font, and who we used to be is buried together with Jesus Christ in his tomb. And when we leave that tomb, we're something new. Because now the Holy Spirit lives in us. We have a new life that loves God and wants to live for God. Amazing how we're changed, but even more amazing to me is how our relationship with God is changed. No longer offspring of vipers, now children of God by adoption. God has adopted me into his family, and no longer is God my angry judge who's ready to sink his acts of judgment into my trunk. Now, now I'm a, a redeemed child of Christ, <coughs> a loved child of my heavenly Father, someone who chooses to be my father and promises me a home with him in heaven. How could all that happen? Because of some crazy guy out in the middle of the wilderness splashing around some water. How could that happen when Pastor Schrader, sinful man, sprinkles water on the forehead? It's only because of what John says next. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who comes after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's talking about the coming King Jesus. And Jesus, and he came as king, was going to kind of look 
a little bit like that guy out in the wilderness, something a little bit off. Because he wouldn't enter this world looking like a king, born in a rented room, cradled in a feeding trough, clothed with rags, and he wouldn't live as a king either. Instead of ruling, he'd be serving, finally dying the death of a criminal on a cross, and even though he would leave this world in triumph and ascend into heaven, it would only be witnessed by a handful of men on a quiet hill. Yet God promised that through his holy service, we would be righteous and holy by faith. By that ugly death, he would earn for us the peace of God's forgiveness the joy of a perfect life to come, the knowledge that as I live here in this world with all of its dis disappointments, it will one day come to an end. And that king who came in humility once, who lived and who died and was crucified, rose again, left this earth, he's going to come again at the end of time, and there will be no confusion about who he is or what he's come to do will come to bring deliverance, peace, and joy, and hope that can't be diminished or hidden by sin ever again. Isn't that the power of repentance? And he uses this image to help us figure it out. He talks about path straightening today. It's easy for us to look out there and see the crooked paths of sinful people. It's easy for us to spot the ditches of despair and the mountains of pride, but John comes to us today and he wants us to do path straightening in our own hearts. Have you dug a ditch of despair and doubt? <coughs> Longing for that to be filled by someone or something, Jesus says, I fill in that ditch of despair. Have you built up a mountain of pride that at times convinces you that you can stand before God based on your own righteousness? Listen to John who points to Jesus, the only one who did it perfectly, and let Jesus chip down that mountain to the base with the knowledge that one day you will stand on a hill that reaches all the way up to heaven. If you have crooked desires, those sins in your life that you refuse to give up. Look to Jesus who walked the path to Calvary's cross and out of love for him and appreciation for what he's done, step off of that path that is only going to lead you to hell and instead walk the straight path that Jesus has laid out for you with the knowledge and the certainty that it leads to your heavenly home. That's repentance. That's what it means to prepare your hearts for Christ's coming. Give up the sins and the doubts and the delusions that we're still holding on to and to clear the way for Jesus to come into our hearts, to enter our lives, to determine our direction and focus our hearts. And I have to tell you, sometimes that kind of life here on this earth, it's going to appear like a wall that's out of plumb. It's going to appear at times like a kook in the wilderness, like splashing of the water at the font. It's going to appear like a criminal's death. But when you walk that path, you have God's promise. You will be blessed. Just as surely as Jesus defeated sin, death, and hell by rising from the grave. Keep that image in front of your eyes as you prepare to receive Jesus this Christmas time and prepare to see him at the end of time too. God help us and God bless us. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that transcends all human understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Join with me in confessing your Christian faith when you use the words of the Nicene Creed on page 7 of your worship folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll bring our offering to the Lord. Please stand for the prayer of the church. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near to God, imploring him to have mercy on us and on all those in need. Heavenly Father, since you have chosen to give us birth through the word of truth, we pray that you would renew in us appreciation for the gift of our baptism, that seizing the opportunities you provide to intercede for those living in the darkness of unbelief, Lord God, as John the Baptist made people aware of their sinfulness so that they would look to the mightier one, Jesus Christ, for their salvation, give all pastors and leaders in the church the courage and faith to do the same. Dear Savior, at the sound of your name, every knee will one day bow. Lead us to marvel anew at your incarnation and daily to give thanks that you have taken on our frail flesh. Like us in every way, 
Great physician of body and soul, you know our weaknesses and needs. You know how we struggle with pain and illness, longing for healing. Remember in your mercy your servants who are ill, hospitalized, or recovering from surgery. According to your will, bless them with a recovery to health that they might again resume the work you've given them to do. Lord, in your mercy. Confident, O oh Lord, that you hear even before we speak, we lay before you our prayers and requests, knowing that you will answer in ways that you deem best for us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
strengthen and preserve you in the one true way, the light everlasting, the heart of peace.
Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing. <coughs> Good morning, welcome to all of you once again. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to everyone who planned and executed the decorating of church for Christmas. And uh, the new decorations we have, if you made those, thank you so very much. Um, this morning, because of the rain, we're gonna have fellowship over in the Education Center. And in the weeks to come, we're gonna try and have that in the courtyard too, so please think about coming out and joining us for a cup of coffee and something to eat in the courtyard after worship in the coming weeks. Today, it's going to be over in the fellowship hall. I wanted to remind you that this week, Thursday, we have women's Bible study. Choir on Tuesday and Thursday of this week at 6 o'clock. Have I missed any announcements that you can think of? Do you have announcements of your own? Yes, Jerry. Thanks for everyone that's been making donations 
I've been informed by someone that works at the food pantry, we could use plastic bags too. We could use some plastic. Okay, if you want to bring a donation for the food bank, there is a collection box in the education center. Also need some uh, like bags from the grocery store, plastic bags. <coughs> Wanted to remind you of the worship schedule coming up. Christmas Eve on the 24th, obviously. It's going to be at 7 o'clock at night. Christmas Day falls on a Sunday, so there's only one worship Sunday service at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we will not have a New Year's Eve service, but New Year's Day worship here on the first regular Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. I wanted to also give you a heads up that we are changing our worship schedule with the first Sunday of the new year. That is January 8th. We go to 8 o'clock at 1030. I think that's everything. Have a wonderful week.